how does these four horsemen fit into this conversation around health span versus lifespan? So when you want to think about the lifespan side of this equation, it seems only logical that one must have a great understanding of what the impediments are to lifespan. In other words, what takes our life away? And for a non-smoker, this can be pretty easily distilled into the big four. And the big four are the diseases of atherosclerosis, so cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, far and away number one, followed by cancer. Of course, as you and your audience know, cancer is not just one disease of, you know, cancer of the breast is different from cancer of the colon, but collectively all of cancer. Number three is neurodegenerative disease and related dementias. So neurodegenerative disease includes Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease, and it also includes other types of dementia, such as vascular dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia, and things like that nature. And then the fourth horseman is not so much on the list because of the number of lives that it directly takes, but because of the number of lives that it indirectly takes. And that's less a disease and more of a spectrum, the spectrum ranging from insulin resistance and NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all the way to type 2 diabetes. It's basically what we think of as the metabolic diseases, which again, in terms of how often those diseases show up on the death certificate as the proximate cause of death is not that large. You know, we're talking about in the United States, maybe 100,000 or so. I would imagine in the UK, slightly less. but it's how those things amplify the risk of the other three horsemen by typically about twofold. So um, what we really want to be careful of is understanding that when you have type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, your risk of cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and heart disease goes up significantly. And so by understanding everything we can about the four horsemen, we have a chance to <clears throat> delay their onset. And that's really the objective here. <clears throat> I don't think we are in a situation, barring science fiction, to completely eliminate the horsemen. Uh, uh, certainly, some of these diseases seem somewhat inevitable to our species. Um, cancer, for example, at the end of the day, is ultimately a tug of war between acquired genetic mutations that alter cellular properties and the ability of our immune system to detect them and evade them. Um, but we can certainly delay these. And we have great proof already that that happens. And the proof exists in the long-lived people, the so-called uh, centenarians, people who live already to the age of 100 or more. And we know from studying these people that their superpower is not living longer with the four horsemen. It's living longer without the four horsemen. Once they come down with the same diseases as the rest of us, the time it takes for them to die is about the same. It's that they get the diseases about two decades later than everybody else. Yeah. And that's what we have to figure out. Yeah, super interesting. That's really quite something for us to reflect on, that these super centenarians, once they get the same problems that we get, the time to death is pretty similar. It's just trying to delay that. So. Coming back to the problems with the medical system, the way it's set up, the way we're trained, the way many of us are still practicing, we get involved very, very late. You know, we diagnose type 2 diabetes at some, you know, theoretical uh, point that we have defined. Um, for many years, I've been teaching doctors in the UK saying, listen, guys, we're we're still reporting an HbA1c of we we have slightly different cutoffs to you guys. So we have 6.5, yes, as the cutoff for type 2 diabetes, but we call pre-diabetes here uh, from 5.7, where I believe you guys start at 6. But nonetheless, you know, a lot of the time, we're reporting the suboptimal blood sugar levels as normal. And, and the way it works in the NHS, typically here, the National Health Service, is what will often happen is that you will get your bloods drawn and you will often be told, if you don't hear from us, everything is okay. Now, 
First of all, that is unsatisfactory <laughs> on a number of levels. A, it's such a big juggernaut of a system. Things go wrong. Things get missed all the time. So I would always say to my patients, phone up, make sure you've got your result. Make sure someone has said something about that result. Just don't rely on the fact that nothing's come in the post. So you're okay. But the wider point is, is that even many doctors are not getting involved with their patient or not taking preemptive action until it's quite far advanced, you know, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, you know, dementia, for example, you know, Dale Bredesen will say that that condition maybe starts in the brain maybe 30 years before you actually get a diagnosis, for example. And so from your perspective, Peter, I know you have quite a bespoke and very targeted practice you know, what are the things that we should be looking out for? What are the things that we can all start looking at in ourselves to make sure that we're not waiting until these diseases have set in and we've got advanced end-stage disease? You know, what are, what are these key things that maybe we're walking around with, but we're not aware of them? Well, it certainly varies by disease, but let's take the clearest uh, example of where prevention is unmistakably able to get us to the point where we would be far more likely to die with a disease rather than from it. And that's the ultimate goal, right? So, you know, I'm sure you've shared this with many of your male patients. I mean, any man who lives long enough will die with prostate cancer, but some will die from it, right? But most men do not die from it, they die with it. And so the, the most broad example of that from a disease perspective is atherosclerosis. Um, Everybody has it to some extent. The goal is to not die as a result of it, not to die of a major adverse cardiac event, a heart attack, a stroke. So what would be required to delay the onset of atherosclerosis? Something that I argue is probably somewhat inevitable to our species. Um, well, again, this is where understanding your opponent matters. Now, heart disease, it turns out atherosclerosis, we have a great understanding of its pathogenesis. And we know that while genes play a significant role, those genes play a significant role often through the modification of the following pathways, lipid-related pathways, blood pressure-related pathways, endothelial dysfunction-related pathways. So what are the big risks for heart disease? Smoking, high blood pressure, elevated ApoB, and metabolic disorders. So the most extreme example being type 2 diabetes, but <clears throat> again, any dysregulation of glucose and insulin is going to be amplifying the risk of type 2 diabetes, uh, pardon me, of cardiovascular disease. So how can we take that information and act on it so that we delay its onset by two decades? Well, this comes down to how you view the world through the lens of prevention. So I can't speak to how it's done in the UK, but I can tell you that in the United States, we tend to view things through a time horizon of about five to 10 years. So we use risk calculators. Yeah. The risk calculators incorporate information such as your family history, whether you smoke or not, what your lipids look like, your blood pressure, things of that nature. Sometimes they even incorporate information such as a calcium score and they spit out probabilities. They say the probability of you having a major adverse cardiac event, so heart attack, stroke, death, in the next five years or in the next 10 years is X percent. And the consensus view here in the United States is you do not need to treat a patient for primary prevention unless that number is above some threshold, typically 5%. So if you're talking to a 39-year-old patient, by definition, it is mathematically impossible for them to have a five or 10 year risk above 5%. In fact, most of the risk models don't even yeah. allow a calculation if age is below 40. In my case, that was the case. I first began to pay attention to this 15 years ago when I was 35 and there were no risk models. So basically no one would consider having treated me preventatively, even though my family history was significant. I even had a speck of calcium on my calcium score which is a, a, a symbol of late atherosclerosis. Um, my view is that that's completely backwards logic. It's backwards for two reasons. The first is 
the time horizon is completely wrong. Yes, it's true that if someone's 10-year risk is high, we need to act dramatically. But to wait until a person's 10-year risk is high is tantamount to driving a car towards the edge of the cliff and telling the driver, you're only allowed to hit the brakes when you actually see the edge of the cliff. Yeah. As opposed to telling the driver, I can't quite see the edge of the cliff now, but I know that there is an edge there. Let's slow the car down. But the second reason to me is even more frustrating. And, and I think if I'm going to be critical of the medical establishment in one regard, it's going to be this, which is <clears throat> there's often a failure to appreciate the implication of causality. And causality is a, is a complicated topic because it's so often confounded with correlation and association. But I'll spare the listener kind of all of the details because I write about it at some length. But there is no ambiguity about the causality of ApoB and its effect on atherosclerosis. I don't know how much your listeners are familiar with ApoB and if it's worth explaining what that is. But Yeah, Peter, I was going to ask you, so please do expand because it's also not a test that the NHS offer people in the UK either. So not only is it, I know very well, a very powerful, if not the most powerful predictor, but at the same time, it's something that people, unless they pay privately here, which is a very different mm -hmm. model, really don't have access to. So yeah, please do, please do explain. Okay. Well, the good news is, first of all, it's a very inexpensive test. Even in, you know, even in the United States with our grossly and disgustingly elevated costs that are artificially inflated, even in the United States, the APOB test is only on the order for about 20, somewhere between 12 and $25. So I would imagine that in the UK, even if one were to pay out of pocket, we're talking about a test that probably would cost less than, you know, 10 pounds. Um, but putting that aside for a moment, um, a poor man's substitute for ApoB, which I assume the NHS would cover, would be non-HDL cholesterol. Yeah. Um, is that something that yeah. would be readily available to anybody? Yeah. Okay. Anyone, so, so non-HDL cholesterol is a poor man's surrogate for ApoB, but what ApoB is is a, it's a protein that's wrapped around all of the particles that cause atherosclerosis, of which the most common is the low-density lipoprotein, or LDL. And by measuring the ApoB concentration, you are directly measuring the concentration, i.e. the number of particles per unit volume, of all the lipoproteins, the LDLs, the VLDLs, IDLs, LP little a's, that cause atherosclerosis. And that turns out to be the most powerful predictor of any lipid or lipoprotein as it pertains to cardiovascular disease. And what you want is for that number to be as low as possible. In formal logic, we would describe ApoB as necessary but not sufficient for atherosclerosis. So you need it to get atherosclerosis. But by itself, it's not sufficient to cause atherosclerosis, which means that there are some people walking around with very high levels of ApoB who do not go on to develop atherosclerosis. But you can't get atherosclerosis without it. So we've established through epidemiologic studies, primary prevention studies, meaning the treatment of people who don't yet have cardiovascular disease, secondary prevention studies, the treatment of people with cardiovascular disease, and Mendelian randomization, perhaps the most powerful of them all. We can explain that if people want in a moment, but I don't think it's germane. We've established through all of these different levels of evidence that low-density lipoprotein, or ApoB, is causally related to atherosclerosis. This is so important. Again, I don't think there are many doctors worth their salt that would not acknowledge that. So now the question becomes, why would we not reduce dramatically at an early age the level of this lipoprotein? And I would use an example that I've used before. I think I use it in the book of smoking. Everybody knows that smoking is causally related to lung cancer, meaning it's not just an association that we see a tenfold higher prevalence of lung cancer in smokers. And by the way, it doesn't mean that every smoker will get lung cancer or every person who has lung cancer was a smoker. Neither of those things are true. 
but neither of those things diminish the causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And because we know that smoking is causally related to lung cancer, we take a very simple preventive strategy, which is we tell people out of the gate, do not smoke. And if you do smoke, stop right away. Can you imagine if we used models to predict the likelihood of people getting lung cancer and waiting until the probability of that event was, you know, 10% and then saying, well, listen, Johnny, you're your risk of lung cancer is now 10%, it's time to stop. Or let's wait until on the chest CT, we see calcified lesions in your lungs that are suspicious for cancer. Now it's time to stop. Of course not. Once you've established causality, you remove the causative agent. And yet we don't take that approach in treating atherosclerosis, which is why atherosclerosis is the leading cause of death globally. 19 million people die every year from atherosclerosis. Number two, is a distant second cancer, 11 to 12 million per year. Atherosclerosis not only shouldn't be the leading cause of death, it shouldn't even be in the top 10 based on the tools we have to delay its onset significantly. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. If you just want to shock the system, then your body gets to reset. Um, and, and one of the, the most popular things to do in the longevity world now is 